Good evening. Welcome to the final keynote lecture of the Critical Theory Certificate Programs Translation Theory Today Conference. I hope everyone's had a great two days for those of you who've been at the conference. For those of you just joining us for the final lecture, welcome. We had a wonderful two days. Uh, we've had the largest of any critical theory conference that we've had. Uh, we had 85 presentations on all aspects of translation and we had 21 panels all of which were moderated and chaired by a member of the CUNY faculty, and I see many of you in the audience tonight, so I want to thank you so much for being here. This lecture with Homi Baba, who we are delighted to have here, it's being given as part of the Critical Theory Today lecture series, which is devoted to bringing the most notable and prominent and influential voices in critical theory to the Graduate Center. Uh, past speakers have included Savoy Zizek, Harold Bloom, and Frederick Jameson, and we're delighted to have Homi Baba now added to their company, so thank you for being here. Uh, the, critical, the Critical Theory Today lecture series was created in support of a proposed certificate program in critical theory, and Professor Asiman and I uh, created the program. It was a four-year process from the initial conception, the initial idea, to its being ratified by Albany in fall of 2014. We are the newest certificate program at the Graduate Center. However, we are already the second largest, and we currently have 109 students enrolled in the Critical Theory Certificate. And those students originate in departments across the humanities and social sciences. So seeing that community that's been built and seeing so many people here tonight, it's really gratifying to know that critical theory is thriving here at the Graduate Center. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the coordinator of the certificate and the director of the center, Dr. Andre Asiman. It has given me great pleasure to see so many people roaming the corridors all day, yesterday and today. As I said yesterday evening, the annual two-day event is the best way we can think of celebrating our certificate program. Now, in its really, it's in its fifth year. Since its, its inception, created to accredit a certificate in theory in addition to a PhD degree, this program has continued to draw numberless students applying to so many departments in both the humanities and the social sciences. When prospective graduate students visit us or when we interview them either here or on Skype, they will always say, in my case, yes, I'm interested in joining the comparative literature program, but can you please tell me more about the critical theory certificate? We at the Graduate Center take great pride in this two-day event. The Graduate Center is the primary doctoral granting body of the wonderful enterprise that is the City University of New York. Here is what in the former B. Altman Building, many of you might remember the B. Altman Building, we are a hothouse of scholarship across our many programs, centers, and institutes, teaching over 4,000 students. In turn, our PhD students reach out to 200,000 students within the City University system. Yesterday and today we discussed translation and whether a theory of translation is indeed possible. Whether that is as we ride home by train, bus, airplane tonight, this two-day event might indeed help each one of us hone a clear view of what we think translation is. What are its undeclared assumptions about language, about culture, identity, and history? What does translation say about us and about others? What is it about translation that makes it so necessary? Why is translation, to use Proust's own imagery, a lens to see with other eyes than our own? And isn't this what enchantment and beauty mean to see the world with a new vision, that is, to see the world other than what it is to us? What is life without other lenses than our own? What is life without art? When it comes to art, many of us refuse to say that a work is beautiful or ugly. With books, many of us today won't say whether a book is good or bad. We say it is interesting. <laughs> we, after all, are not judgmental. 
Installation art is always inst interesting. Uh, installation art is never good or bad, beautiful or ugly. It just is that, okay? But when it comes to translation, hard and fast realities bob to the surface. There is no such thing as an interesting translation of Dante or of Homer or of Tolstoy. There are only good and bad translations, I'm sorry to say, inspired or flat-footed. But there again, what is a good translation? And by extension, what is a bad translation? And suddenly we are in the universe of critical theory. Not just because we are asking how to measure this thing called beauty, but why we need to even raise the question of beauty at all. And by extension, stir, as we do that, the tireless anxiety that is always attendant on anything bearing on critical thinking. To think is to think about the anxiety of thinking while thinking about the subject of our thinking. I am paraphrasing a sentence by Elizabeth Sewell, an author whose work was introduced to me many decades ago by Edward Said. And now that I think of him, who else to steer us through the anxieties of our age than a man who needs literally no introduction, Homi Baba. Good evening. It really is a great honor and a pleasure to be amongst you this evening. I want to thank Professor Andre Asiman for being his usual seductive and beguiling self. Uh, to him, you only say yes, yes, yes. There is no translational uh, ambiguity. Oh, there's only translational anxiety, but no translational ambiguity. So thank you very much. And Claire, thank you very much. And Claire is going to help me with some slides, but I refuse to have her stand next to me like this. So I'm going to bring her a chair oh, okay. so she can sit. I See, might not she, reach. <laughs> well, when you need to, you can. Oh, thank not you too very many, much. But, thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you. Talking about beauty, unfortunately, her beauty is now hidden, but it will be apparent in a, in, 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 in a minute. But it really is a great honor, and I'm particularly um, both excited and moved by the Critical Institute and by the, uh, uh, the, the ambition here at the Cooney Graduate Center, where I have spoken, I think, once before, several years ago, the ambition to deal with difficult things and make them the subject for wider conversation. It seems to me that there is now a huge emphasis on the popular and the belletristic. Sometimes it's more sophisticated, other times less so. But my encounters here, I, there haven't been many, but when I have been here, has always been uh, affirmed and supported by the spirit of Cooney Graduate Center to take on the challenge of complexity. And the Critical Institute, I congratulate you, is just such a, uh, just such a place, I think closely allied to the School of Criticism and Theory, and I can see one of my colleagues from the school uh, just there, hi. Um, and I think we have the same, uh, the same desire to make things uh, more, to make complex things cogent, but no less complex. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. <clears throat> the cave of making can be a dark and desperate place. From time to time, the darkness is dispelled by flashes that dazzle the obscurity. These sudden impulses are too bright to illuminate an idea or light up a thought. There is just too much light. They make the night more impenetrable 
the cave more unbearable. And yet the memory of light lingers on and leads you further into a darkness that slowly reveals its own geography of insight and ignorance. Then voices and shadows begin calling to you from beyond the cave, voices of instruction and encouragement, half inscripted and half intuited, half heard, half imagined. It is these voices, freighted with unresolved conversations and interrupted arguments, that finally help you to hold the thought, to hold on to the thought. And in the midst of that movement of ideas and intuitions, you discover a kind of momentary stillness. The precarious tension involved in holding the thought or the note in common Vibrating beyond the control of any one voice is the timber of translation, working its way into our thinking. In this act of holding a word, a thought, a note, a tone, the grain of the idea or the concept comes to be revealed through the side-by-sideness of the translational dialogue. To hold in common the concept of a third space is to begin to see that thinking and writing are acts of translation. Third space for me is unthinkable outside the locality of cultural translation. It was indeed local knowledge that first led me to the translational concept of the third space of which I have written extensively, by way of some mistranslations in the context of early 19th century evangelical discourses dedicated to the conversion of Hindus to Christianity in northern India. I remember, for instance, <clears throat> the case of the biblical mistranslation of the Holy Ghost as boot or spook <laughs> by a missionary who was at once affronted and perplexed that his purple proselytizing had not persuaded the affrighted nat natives to embrace the Holy Trinity. <laughs> of course, what he didn't understand was to even speak about the boot, the ghost, is not only sacrilegious, but superstition is so strong that to speak about that in your house is like you want to get the guy out of town. <laughs> and then, of course, there were those canny peasants outside Agra who politely turned down the offer of conversion by fulsomely praising the divine language of Christian catechism while expressing their utter disbelief in a religious system in which the word of God could come from the mouth of meat eaters. I have written about this as the problem of the vegetarian Bible <laughs> elsewhere. Raising the problem of meat eating as a foil to conversion seems to make good political sense, but at the same time may well be theological nonsense. Perhaps the oral transmission of scriptures by Hindu priests might have been mentally transposed by the North Indian peasants into the inscriptive instruction proffered by meat-eating Christian priests, resulting in an imagined pollution of sacred texts. Who knows what exactly happened or what was precisely meant at that local point of translational time? The priest who mistook the Holy Ghost for a spook was perhaps simply a bad translator. The peasants who demanded a vegetarian Bible were perhaps shrewd subaltern strategists. It was, however, neither the question of the accuracy of translation, nor the political uses and abuses of cultural miscommunication that initially caught my eye. What struck me with some force 
was the emergence of a dialogic site, a moment of enunciation, identification, negotiation, even a form of recognition that was suddenly divested of its mastery or sovereignty in the midst of a markedly asymmetrical and unequal engagement of forces. In an intercultural site of enunciation, at the intersection of different languages jousting for authority, a translational space of negotiation, what I call the third space, opens up through the process of dissent, dialogue, conversation, strategy, and craft. Adapt adapting an idea from Walter Benjamin's essay, The Task of the Translator, I would suggest that the contingency and indeterminacy of discourse results from a distinction within linguistic intention that is made more easily visible by the practice of translation. The living flux of meaning is difficult to pin down. Recall Lacan's point de capitan. Because the linguistic sign continually shifts from being an object of intention, a Hindi sign, a boot, equivalent or not to the English ghost in translation, to becoming a mode of intention, the cultural and discursive specificity of the sign as a repertoire and reservoir of meaning that has no equivalence in any other language as a way of meaning and being and can only itself be embodied in a moment of enunciation. As Paul Deman once put it somewhat humorously, referring to Walter Benjamin's example of the transnational Franco-German war between Brot and Pain, uh, Deman writes, my daily bread is upset by the French word pain. pain. <laughs> the way in which it is pain, pain, the phoneme, the term pain. The specificity of signification cannot be reproduced in an imitative sense. It can only be represented as an iterative reinitiation of meaning that awakens the sign to the other analogical ways and meanings of linguistic life. Is this not the reason why Benjamin suggests that translation, and I quote, ironically transplants the original into a more definitive linguistic realm since it can no longer be displaced by a secondary rendering the original can only be raised anew and at other points of time. Think here, of course, of the raising of the ghost, of the Holy Ghost as the boot. The third space as a figure of translation emerges in the distinction, perhaps more strongly the disjunction, within the concept of intention that Benjamin associates with the translational law of linguistic supplementation. His celebrated distinction between, and I quote him, between what is meant and the way of meaning it, to which I've already alluded, is the ground on which translation raises anew, so to speak, the afterlife of the original from within the very midst of its flux and fate. And that, I think, is one of the most interesting concepts of the afterlife, that it is not after, it is interstitial, it is in the middle of. Something new happening in the middle of. The preoccupation with the afterlife of thoughts and things is nothing less than a critical intervention into the affirmation of the values attributed to continuity, convergence, progress, and assimilation in the invention of tradition. The translational emphasis on the afterlife is part of Benjamin's critique of the teleological and evolutionary character of historicism in containing and constraining the time and labor of a work, its proscribing periodization. And of course, one of the most interesting, in my view, representations of this problem 
is in that in convolute N of the Arcades project, the section on epistemology. Even it's a much rougher version than what you get uh, in, 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 in the later work on history, but I very much like the, 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 um, um, the struggle to understand this problem of afterlife as it is presented in the convolutes. <clears throat> Benjamin provocatively argues, uh, uh, sorry, the, the afterlife of the of Benjamin provocatively argues, does not embalm its original identity but realizes paradoxically its embryonic character. The afterlife is embryonic. The intensive, the anticipative, the imminent nature of the work's originality. This is why I said that it emerges, the afterlife emerges in the midst of the making of the work. The embryonic moment of translation as afterlife is a rebirth. It is what links the historical narrative of the past to the impending fiction and fate of the future in the sense in which futurity is a strange combination of consequence and contingency. What survives as the embryonic afterlife of the oeuvre is its potential for renewal, transmission, and transvaluation, and I quote, for in its afterlife, which would not be called that if it were not a transformation and a renewal of something living, the original itself undergoes a change. What kind of change occurs in the making of the afterlife, which is at once an extension and an attenuation? Translation, after all, is a construction, like the building of history, written, Rung by rung, Benjamin says, according as chance would offer a narrow foothold and always like someone who scales dangerous heights. Of course, here he's writing as much about the construction of history, a non-progressivist history, but when I read both the work on translation as afterlife together with history as afterlife, and that is in a way where I'm getting to now, the afterlife of translation and the afterlife of history, there are such amazing echoes and resonances in, in, the two, in, in, the, in the two texts, and indeed around this notion of the afterlife and its creation. Written rung by rung, according as chance would offer a narrow foothold, and always like someone who scales dangerous heights. Is this not translation as much as it is any notion of historical cognition or reflection. The answer lies, I believe, in a formal and conceptual change of scale initiated by the breach in intention between the denotative sign of, or object of intention and the objective of the way of meaning it, which is, after all, the heart of the essay on translation. The heart of the essay on translation is this disjunction in the very moment of uh, of, of, the, of intention, as he puts it. And indeed, in his work on history, again, there is an internal struggle with the notion of intention. Intention as the object and intention as the kind of way to the meaning of the object. <clears throat> in this breach, of course, if I can continue with uh, demonstrating this problem as, uh, and returning for a minute to uh, Paul Deman, I would say this disjunction between the, between the meaning of the object and the way of meaning it and the disjunction between them where the work of translation takes place, one might want to say, one might want to make a little prayer to the difficulty of translation by saying, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who give us a pain in the neck Batar baguette. <laughs> a similar breach of intention, the death of intention, as Benjamin calls it, occurs in his reflections on what he calls the historical index, the perilous attainment to the legibility of historical signs and images at a particular time, the now of a particular recognizability. And here I think 
although there is no time here for it, uh, this in itself is a paper on its own, I think, but the concept of actualization in the construction of his historical moments, the now of recognizability, I think has a very deep resonance with the notion of translation uh, in, 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 in the work of Benjamin, but also more generally, this notion of actualization, not the completion of the translation, but the actualization of the act of translation. The afterlives of history and translation share this critical splitting of intention within their very interior. And it is the ongoing labor of this intimate alterity that Benjamin names the foreignness of languages. 15 years later, in 1936, the task of translation, I think is 21, in 1936, Benjamin returns to the subject. He writes, Stressman's dictum intended as a bon mot that French is spoken in every language is more serious than he thought for the ultimate purpose of translation is to represent the foreign language in one's own, which is of course the, dis the discovery of what I've called the intimate alterity within language of the splitting of, the inten of, of intention. The change of scale occasioned by the afterlife in the wake of, of breach of intention has everything to do with the embryonic nature of translation. Transitoriness, not imperceptibleness, is what is emphasized in translation, as the late Barbara Johnson once sharply observed, because the its temporality, the temporality of translation, is the imperfect subjunctive. Foreignness, I believe, leads the way to the region of translation, phrase it Benya means, but remains foreign to its fulfillment. It is the extraterritorial space, you will remember in Benjamin's metaphors, it is the extraterritorial place outside the forest of language, continually, as he says, aiming at the single spot where the echo is able to give, in its own language, the reverberation of the work in the alien one. The recognition of foreignness is the power and the pathos of fragmentation as fragments of a vessel must match one another, although they need not be like one another, so too must translation incorporate the way of meaning without wanting to imitate the sense of the original. And think of that buildup of metaphor metaphors. Embryo, echo, fragment, single spot, on the way to translation, translation as a way, the attainment of legibility at a certain time in a certain place. Just think of the kind of the, the transitoriness, the virtuality of those uh, terms. This deferral in temporal scale, always pointing the way, and the breakdown in formal scale, the fragments of a vessel, finds its analog in the afterlife of history, whose renewal and revision depends on its forms of fragmentation and montage. As Benjamin writes, the assemblage of large-scale constructions out of the smallest and most precisely cut components. Although this demands a longer discussion on historical transition within translation and translational foreignness as part of the rescue of history, and I'm working on this at the moment, I want to tentatively suggest that both history and translation share an effective relationship through what is at once ephemeral and imminent, iterative and initiatory, embryonic and the afterlife. Benjamin's discussion of dialectical contrasts in which the contours of negativity and positivity, the original and the imitation are dialectically, if intermittently inter interdependent, helps us to think in this chiaroscuro of the method and scale of the foreignness of translation as at once the relationality between different languages and cultures and at the same time the alterity within that allows for the articulation of difference. Benjamin writes, it is therefore of decisive importance that a new partition, a new partition be applied 
to what is negative or excluded, we could say between the original and the translation. I'm here myself translating between two texts. So that by a displacement of the angle of vision, a positive element emerges anew, something different from that previously signified. What matters are never the great, but only the dialectical contrasts, which often seem indistinguishable from nuances. It is nonetheless from them that life is born anew. See, so there is the afterlife, the afterlife which emerges in the interstices of the original in a way breaking its intention, breaking its constructed intention. And then there is no sort of sublatory translational moment, just as there is no sublatory messianic historical moment. We are caught in this moment of the interstices, this chiaroscuro, where the smallest change, the diff a, different from a, a difference in the angle of vision makes a small difference, and then remember all the scalar notions of translation, just like the scalar notions in Benjamin's notion of history are the small things, the fragments, the small movements. These small movements, it is from them that life is born in you. And I know that this is a, and I apologize, this is a very complex argument, and I've compressed it, but I just worked it out and I wanted to share it with you because I was excited about it. <laughs> Literally, I, I've been thinking about it and it's somehow I thought, I've got to do this even if, if, if it gets nowhere. But I hope it got somewhere. Do you see what I'm saying here? It, I, I just hope, you, you, uh, this really interested me, the, the way in which translation is a temporal displacement of scale as much as it is of meaning or language. The impress of foreignness as a displacement of the angle of vision in the practice of dialectical contrasts has implications that are ethical and pedagogical, political and psychic. The splitting within intention between the intended object and its way of meaning where foreignness inheres, what I've called the third space, enables a narrative to become the bearer of motivated meanings and deliberative intentions in situ, in a locality, at the very point of translation and its enunciations. Consider a familiar incident from Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness as a translational displacement of the angle of vision of a new vision born from the afterlife of the nuances of dialectical contrasts in the most wretched conditions of empire. Conrad's Marlowe, the ethical and narrative protagonist of the novel, knows only too well what it means to live in conditions of moral opacity. Shrouded in a forest of signs, I'm echoing the Benjaminian notion of translation as not being in the, in the, itself in the forest, but an echo from the outside. Shrouded in a forest of signs that render the conditions of speech and action barely intelligible or translatable. <clears throat> we were cut off from the comprehension of our surroundings. We glided past like phantoms, wondering and secretly appalled as sane men would be before an enthusiastic outbreak in a madhouse. In the midst of this bedlam, he sees a French man of war shelling the bush, firing into a continent in pursuit of a camp of natives, they call them enemies, hidden out of sight somewhere. I'm aware many of you must know this passage. That's why I chose it. Conrad's theater of asymmetric warfare, as we might call it today, is accompanied by a narrative insistence that the knowledge of identity and difference is as much a question of epistemology and history as it is a perceptual and phenomenological problem that relates to how we see and from where we look, to go back to this notion in dialectical contrast, the, the a displacement of the angle of vision as the translational moment, as the moment of the, of the what happens or what comes about anew. Um, um, it's, it's, uh, so it's a phenomenological problem that relates to how we see and from where we look precisely the displacement of the angle of vision. Are natives taken to be enemies because they're hidden out of sight somewhere? Is this an existential and political anxiety in the face of what seems alien? Or does such alienation mask the annihilatory strategy of the imperialist? 
Is it self-projection or self or, or self-protection? Is it the refusal of translation or mistranslation? What should the ethical line be drawn and where? To draw a line that distinguishes friend from enemy, Marlowe approaches the other, shrinks the distance and enters into a form of ethical proximity, as we might call it. Marlowe brings to bear to the highest degree what Benjamin describes for both history and translation as the imprint of the perilous critical moment on which all reading is founded. When the natives are observed within six inches, Marlowe is again, the scale is important, within six inches, Marlowe is convinced of the injustice of naming them enemies or criminals. These men could by no stretch of imagination be called enemies. They were called criminals and the outraged law, like the bursting shells that had come to them, an insoluble mystery from the sea. As Conrad's narrative destroys the naming frameworks of war, enemy, and legality, criminality, it moves us closer towards identifying with the native's historic situation and his human condition, rather than accepting those projected African identities and self-serving vocabularies that are shaped for the purposes of war and the law of conquest. Half effaced within the dim light in all the attitudes of pain, abandonment, and despair, they were not enemies, they were not criminals, they were nothing earthly now, nothing but black shadows of disease and starvation. Then glancing down, I saw a face near my hand and the sunken eyes looked up at me, enormous and vacant. I found nothing else to do but to offer him one of my good Swede's ship's biscuits I had in my pocket. He had tied a bit of white worsted around his neck. Why? Where did he get it? Was it a badge, an ornament, a charm, a propitiatory act? Again, the nuance of translation. Was there any idea at all connected with it? It looked startling around his neck, this bit of white thread from beyond the seas. Not enemy, not criminal, having glimpsed the Levinasian face of the other, Marlowe can now focus closely on this tiny bit of white worsted whose social origins and cultural significance are for him at this stage ambiguous and enigmatic. As the arbitrary sign shifts through the open frame of translation, it marks the distance and the difference that lies in between the relative familiarity of a badge and the relative unknowability of a propitiatory act. Somewhere between these two, Marlow enters the third space of translation. He's now engaged in a translational temporality in which the sign of the white worsted from beyond the seas, part of the exploitative cotton trade, is an object of intention that has lost its initial mode of intention in the colonial space. The familiar origin of the worsted as a commodity of colonial trade passes through an estranging realm of untranslatability in the heart of darkness and emerges ready to be raised anew and at another point of time. Precisely, the nuanced displacement of an angle of vision. The openness of this thread to translation, that living flux that marks the difference between intention as object and as modality, shifts the balance of discourse from the language of enmity to the language of ethical proximity. I saw a face near my hand and the sunken eyes looked up at me, enormous and vacant, but that is not all. If Marlowe's gaze had stopped there, it could have been read as merely an act of pity, an act of sentimental philanthropy. But beyond the duality of the silent face-to-face -face encounter lies still the worrying white piece of worsted, a mediating material element from the object world 
of trade and exploitation that talks back to Marlowe as he probes its origin and function. It is the thread as a mediating third space that designates the dialogical relation between the narrator and the native as contending and contradictory positions within a war of conflict. He had tied a bit of white worsted around his neck. Why? Where did he get it? The thread, I believe, signifies a thickness of cultural consciousness that is as enigmatic as the obliquity of the signifier through which it is enunciated. In reaching out to the specific thought of the other and grappling with what is not entirely intelligible, what is as yet untranslatable within it, there lies the possibility of identifying also with the unconscious of the other and its own translational flux of language and thought and extending oneself in the direction of the neighbor's legible will and unreadable desire. And this strikes me as being much more uh, challenging in the translational relation to the foreign, to foreignness, either as alterity or as, uh, as, as, uh, as other forms of uh, identification, because the level playing field of dignity and respect are overblown. The relation to the other is to take the risk of the unconscious of the other, to, re to recognize the desire and the untranslatability. And I think this is in some ways also uh, a kind of Levinasian thought. Not the recognized legal, jurisdictional, juridical notions of dignity, respect, and so on, but to risk, to risk identifying with the untranslatable, the nuance, to take the risk of the displacement of the angle of vision. The third space is a challenge to the limits of the self in the act of reaching out to what is indeed liminal in the historic and linguistic experience. There is no fact more significant in the encounter between cosmopolitan norms and global ethics than Immanuel Kant's observation that the earth isn't flat. Had the earth been a capacious plane of infinite unfolding horizons, it is conceivable that peoples with adverse beliefs and conflicting interests might have had space enough and time to live in silos of separation without impinging upon one another. The spherical surface of the planet makes this linear living impossible, as Kant suggests, and it is upon the evidence of the globe's curvature that Kant constructs both his moral geography and his international jurisprudence. And I bring this here because of the way in which in the, in the Conradian text you have this kind of coming together, this scalar meeting, this meeting, this contingent meeting or almost. I sometimes think that, uh, that Kant's ideas on hospitality, which I'm going to talk about in a very truncated way, it's the larger chapter in the book has much more on it, that these ideas are as much, if not more, uh, dependent on his notions of geography than of uh, the, uh, the ethical imperative. The spherical surface of the planet makes linear living impossible. And it is upon the evidence of the globe's curvature that Kant constructs both his moral geography and his international jurisprudence, in my view. The larger implications of our spherical existence are simply and significantly stated by the legal philosopher Jeremy Waldron. We live on the surface of a sphere so that if I go far away enough from you in one direction, I will sooner or later find myself approaching you from the other direction. Again, the notion of the displacement of the angle of vision th working through the untranslatable that I've dem tried to demonstrate in the reading of Conrad. The homespun adage, what goes around comes around, might be a quotidian version of the wisdom of the sage of Königsberg, who conceives of cosmopolitanism as a right grounded in the moral imperative 
to act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always at the same time as an end and never merely as a means. Such a lineage of affiliation and mutual recognition installs the ethic of universal hospitality as the centerpiece of Kant's cosmopolitan right. And despite its ambivalent shadow lines, it is Kant's concept of hospitality that makes him our contemporary. Here, and I quote, here, as in the preceding articles, it is not a question of philanthropy, but of right. Hospitality means the right of a stranger not to be treated as an enemy when he arrives in the lands of another. One may refuse to receive him when this can be done without causing his destruction. One may refuse to receive him when this can be done without causing his destruction. But so long as he peacefully occupies his place, one may not treat him with hostility. It is not the right to be a permanent visitor that one may demand. A special beneficent agreement would be needed in order to give an outsider a right to become a fellow inhabitant for a certain length of time. It is only a right of temporary sojourn, a right to associate which all men have. They have it by virtue of their common possession of the surface of the earth, where as a globe they cannot infinitely disperse and hence must finally tolerate the presence of each other. Originally, no one had more right than another to a particular part of the earth. I just love the simplicity of this idea, you know. Again, a scalar idea. There is this kind of curvature, and if we keep going from different directions, we're going to get together. We might as well make sense of it. I'm being a little banal here. <clears throat> the universality attributed to the law of hospitality is not without a sustained tension between the ethics of arrival and the politics of residence. And of course, you will hear here the difference in a way between Kant and Derrida on the unlimited notion of hospitality, which I have some, something to say elsewhere. Hospitality is extended to the stranger to put him or her out of harm's way, refugee protection as we might call it, so long as the stranger is a docile, deferential subject who peacefully occupies his place. Hospitality makes the stranger a supplicant, not a claimant. Rights of residence that establish you as a fellow inhabitant or citizen for a certain length of time are a consequence of special beneficent agreements. Set against the territorial regulation of the ethic of hospitality is the natural law of universal hospitality signified by the globe's spherical surface that provides the ground for what Kant calls cosmopolitan right. And I especially wanted to juxtapose this with the Conrad because there is a kind of metaphorical sphericality in the infinite detail by which the encounter with alterity is treated step by step, six inches, three feet, one. I just, I, I, I thought that it, it would work richly together. Cosmopolitanism sits astride a gap between the terrestrial and the territorial, between the natural law of hospitality and constitutional sovereignty. The law of hospitality has an interstitial presence, I would suggest, that gives Kant's cosmopolitanism a certain exigent and insurgent reality. As Sheila Ben Habib observes, the right of hospitality is situated at the boundaries of the polity. It occupies the space between human rights and civic and political rights, between the rights of humanity in our person and the rights that accrue to us insofar as we are citizens of specific republics. And I just want to say here, that part of this larger work is about, uh, at the, that I'm doing at the moment is about the refugee crisis. And here, when I, when I encounter this phrase, situated at the boundaries of the polity, I have to share with you that yesterday we had a geographer talking about, at Harvard talking about the refugee crisis. I'd invited a geographer to do so, talk very much now about islands and the way in which islands are being treated as it, as it were, as being sort of, extraterritorial territories, somewhere not inside the nation, not entirely outside the nation, but a space where a whole uh, range of uh, forms of illegality, forms of uh, untimeliness are being practiced. How do we read this seemingly paradoxical predicament that it once proposes a right and prescribes its freedom? I'm tempted to call this a moment of dissensus in the spirit of Rancière's use of the concept in his reading of Kant's aesthetics. Dissensus is the essence of political argument and action. It is, qua Kant, and I quote, 
the construction of a paradoxical world that puts together two separate worlds, hospitality and sovereignty. And the thread of translation is to put together two different worlds and produce what I've called a kind of third space. What occurs in the process of dissensus is neither a confrontation nor a contradiction. It is, Rancière claims, a gap in the sensible itself. The paradoxical emplacement of two worlds side by side makes visible a thirdness, a task of translation, that which had no reason to be seen but has come to be actualized. What I earlier described as the force of the foreignness of translation and effecting a displacement of vision, a nuance of the afterlife that brings with it a new embryonic emergence. Not only is the structure of dissensus, the putting of two worlds in one and the same, analogous to the structure of Benjamin's argument, but it captures the spirit of those political subjects and ethical commitments that make Kant our contemporary. Kant's stranger throws into relief the partial and incipient sovereignty of the nation in an era of global expansion and communication. In, the, in realms of travel and technology. He actually talks a, in a, a, a great deal about that. The law of hospitality questions the necessity of an imagined community and is suggestive of our duties and obligations in post-national context. Not only does Kant narrate the origins of the spherical global rights of the Earth's surface from the perspective of borderline subjects, the marginal, the disempowered, the migrant, but in so doing, he interrogates the status of citizenship rights as the imprimatur of modern political agency. However speculative, and I've suggested the limitations of his views on world citizenship might be, Kant's democratization of the concept of legitimate political agency outside the aura of citizenship is closely aligned to the aims of Rossier's concept of dissensus. If there is a positive content for this term, and Rancière is also in dialogue with Kant, it consists in the dismissal of categories of those who are or are not qualified for political life. The very difference between man and citizen is the opening of an interval for political, for political subjectivation. A political subject is a capacity for staging scenes of dissensus. It would be difficult to conceive of a cosmopolitanism, insurgent or exigent, without restructuring the scope and power of the concept of citizenship and its various problematic lineages of legitimacy, however much as a form of security it is desired as we see today in the migrant crisis. At the root of the difficult freedom that underscores these ideas of a kind of translational third space, there is, however, a resourceful and redemptive idea that blends in beautifully with the vision of the artist Zarina Hashmi. Can we have the second slide, please? This is one of her works, uh, Baghdad, from, it did a whole series called The Cities the city is blotted into the wilderness, reference to uh, Adrian Rich. With a slight modification of the notion of cosmopolitan right, it would be true to say that Zarina's work has moved across regions and established communication by using the common right of the face of the earth. The movement of peoples are caused by different histories and given shape in diverse forms. What is unfailingly true of most journeys are the experiences of displacement and discovery, at times despairing, at other times elevating. Jeremy Waldron sums up Kant's ideas of cultural movement, as I mentioned, in a way that speaks directly to the ethics of community and communication. Displacement and dispossession are profoundly unsettling experiences in the making of a life, but their influence on Zarina's work her choice of materials, her cultivation of craft and technique, her conceptual savoir-faire has shaped a career with an emphasis on the ongoing poesis of fracture. I deliberately use the somewhat arcane word fracture 
in the spirit in which Hannah Arendt uses the word poesis, to emphasize not only the human labor invested in making the things of this world, but also in the way in which, through that making, these objects, these words, these moments, entail the coming together of people in what she calls the human interest, that which lies between, that which is intangible, both action and language. Each etape of Zarina's existential journey seems to have posed a significant life decision, while at the same time repositioning her as an artist who has been repeatedly faced with the choice of new materials in new places and new practices. The task of translation, no less. Each geographical move and cultural shift leads to an engagement with materials, techniques, and traditions valued for the, their, for the foreignness of their translatability or untranslatability, for the foreignness of their provenance within her own internal practice. And with each such revision of concept and craft, Zarina maintains a remarkable aesthetic integrity in furthering her own visual language and deepening the historical resonances of her iterative inscriptions. The next one, please. Homes I made a life in nine lives. One of the remarkable things about her work is the, is the kind of almost simplistic architectural ground plans uh, to which at times she tags a bit of poetry, often in Urdu, uh, sometimes in English. Uh, but there is a way in which um, she is able to provide in these very simple black and white plans a kind of affectivity of space, which is very difficult, I think, to do. The only architectural drawings where I've seen this is in, in the work of Luce, where he was very concerned uh, with, when Luce was very concerned with uh, the way in which the very simple demarcation of space carried with it an affect. <clears throat> These material practices that I have termed the poesis of facture are more than mere surfaces of inscription or material submitted to transformation. They're as active in their signification of cultural translation as any other discursive or semiotic system. And I've often thought that, we, that, we, that we've been so trapped in the idea of visuality or in the idea of face-to-faceness or in the idea of binaries or polarities things that I have resisted in thinking about forms of foreignness or otherness or alterity, that there are ways in which the making of work is also, the making of work is the work of translation to, the making of work is the encounter with alterity, and I find that very much in her case. The resistance of the Japanese woodblock is a necessary force of alterity, that must be both withstood and worked with. And she often has commented on this, of course, not in this language, that it was for her a real education to know that it was the pressure that you put on the woodblock, not necessarily even the image that was left afterwards, but the act of placing the pressure was the encounter with the foreignness of the material or the medium. <clears throat> Joining up parallel lines on fine paper in Paris have to be reconstituted in the drafting of the iterative floor plans of homes I have made that turn into haunting geotemporalities in which architectural design captures the psychic climate of affect and autobiography and longing and loss and displacement. Next slide. When image and text are read side by side, I cannot help notice a secular, ironic displacement of the relationship between Islamic calligraphy and sacred architecture. Just as the ornate calligraphy of Quranic verses and historical dates cover minarets, mosques, and mausoleums as records of collective memory, so here in Zarina's work, the ground plans of homes are labeled with personal dates attached to poetic evocations, that recalled thresholds of memory in her narrative of private displacement and public dispossession. 
Serena's intimate engagement with the foreignness of craft and concept fulfills a need for cultural translation that she sees wanting in contemporary art historical discourse. In an interview, Zarina bemoans the fact that we don't have the fluency to be able to talk about people who come from different cultures within contemporary discussions. Everything has to be explained within the rhetoric of existing paradigms. Zarina's work, as I have argued, represents just such a paradigm of fluency in the articulation of cultural translation. In the experience of her art, alterity is not merely a hermeneutic practice of ontological inquiry or ethical responsibility. It is an actual form of facture, a way of doing, a, mode, a, a moment of poesis. Zirina's engagement with the Japanese woodblock, Islamic calligraphy, sanganeri pulp of paper, Richard Serra's quartet steel or Eva Hesse's skeins of straight, straighted threads, Threads are in themselves intercultural interlocutions. In this sense, then, the issue of alterity becomes an, an ethics and an aesthetics of facture, of making progress as poesis rather than aspiring to the social construction of a modern sublated progress. Seen in this way, intercultural art practice recalls once again Benjamin's proposal that cultural translation is a coming to terms with the foreignness of language, such foreignness revealing the liminality of both the indigenous and the extraterritorial. Working with materials and modalities of difference, whether linguistic, visual, or digital, demands something other than finding a consensual form of resemblance or appropriation. Translation does not aim to achieve likeness, in an uncomplicated mimetic sense, translation is fraught with the productive tensions that Agamben describes in his inquiry into the complications of the concept of similitude as indeed a practice of alterity. There are two words in Latin that derive from the Indo-European root meaning one. Similis, he writes, which expresses resemblance in simul, which means at the same time. Thus, next to similitudo, resemblance, there is simulus. That is the fact of being together, which implies also a rivalry, an enmity. And next to similare, to be like, there is simulare, to copy, to imitate, which implies also to feign and to simulate. And we come back to the brot and the pay and the pain. Translation is a border conflict for which we endlessly negotiate memoranda of understanding. The task of translation is to liberate what is imprisoned in the foreign tongue, breaking through the decayed barriers, as Benjamin puts it, of the indigenous tradition. The fluency that Zarina seeks is to be found in the freedom of intercultural conversation, not in the burden of multicultural representation. It is surely Zarina's repeated memory of the traumatic journey as a child during the independence struggle, during partition, from Aligarh to Delhi to escape the violent anti-Muslim riots, which is her experience of the first displacement, the primal dispossession, the earliest wound of the intimacy of foreignness. This gnarled knot of memory is never far from her mind and her art. This is Zarina speaking in 1991. Aligarh was identified as a Muslim town, very much so until independence came and the country was divided. We were scared. We thought we would be killed. I did see the villages around Aligarh burning. Then we were all taken to Delhi in a covered truck. Until this day, I remember it, smell of rotting flesh. There were people dead in the streets, and there was nobody to pick them up. But you know, when you were young, you just cling to your parents. You feel safe and secure. Home is the center of my universe. I make home wherever I am. It's my hiding place, a house of four walls with four wheels. There is magic in that place. Serena's planetary universe of exile is geotemporal rather than simply geopolitical in the traditional sense. 
The metaphors of space are the customary ways in which we describe the geographies of our lives. Serena's practice certainly locates memory in the ground plans of homes, inhabited and uninhabited, cities mapped and bombed, but she also locates memory in the less tangible language of time that will not be tethered to space. Time and memory resound with the echoes of place, date and event, but they are bound in her powerfully restrained use of affect the realm of conscious and unconscious processes in which a displacement of the angle of vision is the difference between life and death and survival. Serena's work brings to mind, as I conclude, a question posed by the philosopher Abishai Margalit in a discussion of the ethics of memory. Is the moral witness a forward-looking creature, even when his or her testimony is about the past? And how do we translate the difference? The task of translation, as I have engaged it in your company today, gives me the courage to suggest a response. The moral witness is caught in that precise flux, in that moment where the denotative security is shaken by the foreignness of ways of meaning. The moral witness is caught in a double time frame of memory surviving the testimony of the past while aspiring to the values of survival and the future. One might say, that in translation, we live with a past that refuses to die while being confronted by a future that will not wait to be born. In between them lie the perils and the pleasures of the present. It is the infinite struggle of the labor of translation that allows us to maintain a precarious balance in the afterlife that is, after all, the condition of our very own communal existence and the language and literature that sustains us in our work and in our words. Thank you very much. have some questions. We have two microphones. Please ask them. Yes, sir. There's a microphone right next to you. Was that all right? This was perfect. This was lovely. Lovely. And it came through well. I mean, this was... Yeah, this was lovely. This yeah. was something that we have... We're happy to have recorded. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions, please? The microphones are right. There's a microphone next to you, sir. So this gentleman is from Sudan. No. Uh, thank you very much. Please, before you ask your question, make sure they're short questions and not disquisitions. <laughs> <laughs> you have spoken. Uh, uh, it's me. You have spoken at length um, about Joseph Conrad and his work, the masterpiece. Uh, heart of Darkness, all through you spoke about Marlowe, you never mentioned Kurtz. And Kurtz, and the beauty of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness is the narration within the narration. Marlowe was talking about Kurtz, the man, the white man, who made himself a god in Africa yeah. and enslaved black people to yeah. collect mm -hmm. ivory. Yes. You never um, talked about that. You all through talked about Marlowe, which was talking the, the Thames. Yeah. Um, this is translatable anyway. Uh, we can agree or disagree. My second question is, do you believe Fenang's Wake, 
by James Joyce. I can't hear you. The I translatable didn't work. Yeah, please, let's have one question Sir. first. And then, because other people will ask questions as well. Yeah. I have two questions, and I made them. If I, if I can't hear. And I, uh, your first question, I understand, and I can respond to. What is your second question? The second question, um, talking about translation. Yes. Uh, the theory and practice. Finang's work written in 20 years by James Joyce. And to read it, you may need six years or seven years just to read it. <laughs> Do you think <laughs> translation is applicable with such tremendous artistic achievement? Thank you. Well, for the first question, I chose a very specific moment in, uh, um, in, in Conrad for a very specific point, which was to do with proximity and translation. As far as Kurtz goes, there is a very different issue. But Conrad is no less white than Kurtz is white. So that's not a, a race issue by any means at all. I chose a particular moment because, as I tried to explain, it was a moment where there was an ongoing notion of translation as transition. Are they enemies? Are they not enemies? Why does he have a white thing on his neck? So that was the process that I actually wanted to display. And it. Uh, uh, there are other problems of translation as far as Kurtz goes, uh, exterminate the brutes, but that's a different problem. I, and it was not the problem that I was wanting to draw attention to in terms of the ethics of uh, proximity and the, and the untranslatable. Uh, the point I was making, of course, was this, that, that, to that, that, uh, that a real intercultural translation takes the risk of the unreadability of another, not simply the way in which one can put them in the frames with which we already have, even if those frames are deeply benevolent frames of dignity or respect. So I was trying to get away from that conventional, in some ways, uh, language of, uh, some parts of the language of human rights in the recognition of otherness. So I was just trying to move away from that. Kurtz was, did not seem to me to be relevant to that at all. As far as your second question, as far as I understood it, uh, I think uh, I, I think you meant you talked about Joyce. Is that right? About yeah. It seems to me that he, this is this is not the kind of question I can answer because I'm not an actual translator. Mm -hmm. But I think that it is a, it is a very important uh, issue, and it is for that reason that, for instance, if I understand you right, there are many. There are many forms of translation where, for instance, poetry is better translated in some ways as prose rather than within its own forms. Uh, the, the, I think in each of these cases, the question of the untranslatable, not only as a philosophical problem, but also as a practical problem, becomes an issue. How do you find a form for that which might not be immediately accessible? The way in which I see the problem in terms of what I talked about is this interesting uh, notion of Benjamin's that in between, that the very notion of intention itself is in crisis in translation, but it is out of that crisis that translation becomes possible. Thank you. Jonathan, do you want to go? Jonathan, go ahead. Jonathan, go yes. ahead. Sure. Um, so I'm just curious about the, um, you, you seem to be describing translation as occurring in media arrest, right, in the middle yeah. of. Um, but whenever narratives are encountered in media arrest, there's that moment of incomprehension, that moment of groping and struggling. So I want you to talk a little bit about um, how one overcomes this moment of incomprehension as one seeks to orient oneself, right? In particular, thinking about Kant, I mean, this is what Kant is, you know, in his geography, it's all about this, this ethical orientation that can permit, like, sort of, you know, humans to, to, to get along with one another. So as one... Sorry, I can't hear, and I'm terribly sorry, I just can't hear the, I mean, I get the, uh, uh, the, the point about being in media's rest. Yes. I can't, I didn't hear what you said after that. Well, because you, you were talking about Kant, and Kant's um, geography is in part a a a, um, a way of 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 being alongside one another. Yeah. Um, but if you are in media arrest, then there's that moment of incomprehension that puts that puts this under pressure and puts it, it puts it into threat. And so I just want you to 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 talk a little bit about incomprehension Thank you. and the way that's, that it works in translation. That's a that's an excellent question. The the very basis of meaning as flux 
And indeed, the ethics of translation, it seems to me, has to deal with, take responsibility for the untranslatable. This is why I said, and I chose that part of Conrad uh, in my reading of it, which is to take the bet, to take the chance on the others, the unconscious of the other, if I might put it like this, the place where what is visible may not be explicable. That is what, what a kind of an ethics of neighborliness is about, neighborliness in the, you know, not in the suburban sense. Uh, 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 that's what I, that's the risk, and I think that is why um, there is a paradox in the untranslatable, i.e., the untranslatable is not something that evaporates. The untranslatable is something that we have to negotiate. We have to walk around and to work with, uh, which is why I've always been less, uh, uh, been less charmed by certain forms of deconstructive practice which, is a, which seem to me to defer the deferral further than I want to defer it. Yes, yes, thank you. You see what I'm saying? I th so I think that the, un so the, the issue you raise is a very important one. I do not want to give up the notion of the, if you're not in medias res in translation, then you're not in translation. But if you are, then there have to be a whole set of uh, choices that you make. And those choices are precisely the choices between the, the meaning, the denotative, and the way to meaning, the way something is meant. You know, this is why I played around with, you know, give us our daily bread, da 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 da, pain in the neck, baguette, batah, you know. The, so I think that it is the ch great challenge of translation to put us in this difficult place. Um, and that's why I played for a long time with different ways of thinking about the foreignness of languages as being part of an, did, did you see that, as being part of an internal alterity, which if, it, if there isn't that, then you cannot even begin to think of intralingual translation as an ethical practice. Now, however, I have to say that uh, somebody uh, uh, recommended a new book about translation, and I looked at it, and it, it has a stinging attack on me uh, <laughs> for saying, so now, according to Baba, it's a recent, so we translators have to take the burden on our shoulders of the rest of the world, of the ethics of, of, of recognition, da da da, of representation. So it, I have to tell you that there is another version of what I'm, there's another approach to what I'm saying, and I think due diligence requires me to tell you that I got a bum rap uh, uh, in this, I, I don't agree with it. I think I can argue it down. But the book does cost $140. Hopefully no. And I have, since this was pointed out to me, I'm waiting for the library copy. I mean, I would have thought it was good etiquette if you're going to give somebody, I have a small bum rap, but if you're going to give somebody, a, you, send, you, know, you send it to them and say, here it is. But, uh, uh, you know, at 140, I can understand why the author decided that I should get it from the library. <laughs> Please. I, I, just, I just wanted to foreground my question with two images that you, that you presented, which I found very useful, very... Um, Thank you. Uh, one of them is Conrad, this Polish-speaking migrant who changes himself, changes his language, right. and in, his, in that changes his ability to, to perceive and encounter others. And the second is that from Aligar, which really points towards a whole different set of questions around the incapacity of Neruvian models of modernity in India to attend to certain minoritarian communities. Yes. My dear friend, I completely agree with the, la with the latter but we won't get into Neruvian politics now. I understand, now. I understand. I, but but at, I, I at another time. But I appreciate, just, I appreciate, I appreciate your, your... But let me just tell you that, of course, one of the great tragedies of 
uh, that moment was that the Constitution of India, uh, you know, was chaired, the drafting of the Constitution was chaired by Ambedkar. Yes, uh, yes. And, 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 and that, that spirit that is of a minoritarian constitution has right. really not been carried out. And in fact, we see at the moment, we see at the moment in India, uh, and here I'm, I'm a literalist and not a translationist, but in the moment in India, we see a real violation. Yes, of, thank you. Of, thank of you for spirit. recognizing that. Yeah. So, so these, as far as the, uh, the Conrad... But, sorry, yes, but I, no, I just wanted... I, I, can I, I just, I was, those are the images that that brought up my question. Oh, so now the question is to come. The question is to come because okay. those were just, uh, that was just to set up the question, which is about what you're doing here pedagogically. You, yeah. you may not be a translator, but you are, you are an educator. And I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about this educational project as an ethical, as part of this ethical imperative of displacement. How do we displace our students into the present at times in ways that are useful and striking for them. Well, thank you very much. And I hope you saw the importance of this notion of the displacement of the angle of vision, which is a different way of thinking about dialectical interaction, right? Uh, I, I hope you saw the uses of that. Okay, so it seems to me that uh, to answer the pedagogical question, in my experience, it's more often the, um, uh, it's more often the uh, demands of students and even their desires which has made me rethink my own pedagogical and curricular path. Uh, precisely because they are not professionalized as we are. The question of knowledge and the question of what they want to understand, certainly when they come into the university, is much more generous than what we think they need to know from us. So it seems to me that that's how I, 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 I see it. And um, there's a lot of the very positive pressure, pedagogical, in trying to shift one's angle of vision. Now that does not mean that this displacement of the angle of vision, which is a different problem, and I think more, a more productive way of thinking about uh, Benjamin in these contexts than the dialectical image, uh, which is a, you know, has had a much greater kind of uh, popularity. Uh, the two are not distinct, but the two are not different, but they, 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 there is a distinction between them. But it seems to me that the question of curricular innovation and curricular translation is what is really needed, not when, you know, I started teaching, there was African literature, Caribbean literature, da-da-da literature, DDD literature, and there were all these silos. And I think what now, in this phase, what is important are larger, intermediatic, cross, I don't want to say interdisciplinary, but cross-conceptual ways of thinking. Uh, that, that that, that there, it, you know, interdisciplinarity used to either be you take your own discipline and you put around it all the useful other disciplines that deepen your own discipline. But there are other ways of thinking about what happens in the, on the boundaries of disciplines where indeed the, the rules are not as clear. And of course, tenure is a huge problem in, in that <laughs> thought. Let's not, let's not fool ourselves. Tenure becomes a major issue then. Who has the authority? But it seems to me that we are moving more in ways where the questions we want to pose pedagogically do not belong to any specific methodology or any specific di uh, disciplinary home. It is a stretch for all of us. And that, I think, is the task of translation at the pedagogical level. Does that answer your question? Very much so. Thank you. Very Thank you. Very yes. Carol. Yes, hi. I have a question about uh, scale and size yes. because politically it's always talked about uh, the spaces are too large or too small and I think it's interesting in Benjamin when he also has that image of the fruit which is very small yeah. and the vessel which you can hold in your hands as opposed to 
other larger structures. And um, my question is, how do you envision the third space as not having any size or, or scale, I should say? Thank you. That's a very, very in interesting question. You know that I've always derived the scalar nature of what I have called third space precisely by, by, by placing it in, this in, in, in medias res, by deriving it from the problem, not imposing a, a, a kind of space on the problem. As you know, for instance, there is so much sophisticated or unsophisticated written about globalization which assumes either immensity or locality. And I've always felt that was the, entirely the wrong way to think of the dynamic or the dialectic of it. I think to me, the scalar is not large or small. It is about intersections of complexity of scale. It is about the movement of scale, how, how, you, how things move even in a specific spatial or temporal moment, how different kinds of scale work, and why there is a scalar transformation. What is the pressure that wants to make you think about the fragment, say, rather than the whole? Or what is the pressure in um, Benjamin's uh, work on, on history in, in, and his critique of Marx, which makes him want to think of montage? And when you think about montage, it is not merely the given conventional notion of montage. Montage is not something you impose as a scale. It is what emerges and then is tested, just like every act of translation, as I was trying to say, does not simply, it's not simply an imposition. It comes out of trying to resolve, uh, resolve or to think about a problem. And so I think scalar shifts, both temporal, spatial, and intertemporal, are very important. Thank you. Does that respond to your question? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much you for very your much. Thank you. Thank you so much.